Hello, hello. It's Wednesday at one o'clock and I'm about to start our live. So I'm going to give everyone a few minutes to get situated. I hope the process on the other side is getting easier. Um, if you are new and you have not joined us yet for our Wednesday live, if you would um, post where you're from and if you have a favorite vintage machine or if there's one that you really want that you haven't acquired yet. Um, I've mentioned before that the one machine still left on my list, list is the Elna Grasshopper, which is also the model number one. Um, I haven't really been actively looking for it, but it's it's it will complete my collection. So, um, and if you've joined us um, before, if anybody has had any luck, if you started looking around, um, applying anything that we've taught over the last uh, two, yeah, we're two weeks in. Um, if you've asked about people getting rid of machines that you can take on from them, just curious. Uh, before I get into, oh, be, I'm Andy Barney, by the way, for everyone who's new. Um, I teach sewing machine repair, service, restoration, and troubleshooting. My whole goal is to kind of switch the paradigm of our industry, which, um, as I said last week and the week before, is that, um, you know, for probably as long as we've all been sewing, the only options you've had is to go in to see a service person. And uh, they don't always tell you what's wrong with your machine. There may have been nothing wrong with your machine. So we're working on shifting the control to being in your hands rather than um, someone else's hands. So that's kind of our big goal here. Um, and so I, I really enjoy doing the Wednesday Lives. We're gonna keep doing this. I'm gonna show you our upcoming schedule here in just a minute. Um, before I do that, I'm going to share my screen. So be patient with me. I know we had a huge mishap last week. My apologies for that. If you didn't find them already on the Facebook live page on our website, which is sewingdocacademy.com, you will find a, um, where I included the slides that you can download that were missing in the um, presentation. So that was the cabinets and all that good stuff. I am going to share my screen for just a minute. I had an, um, one of the participants in the vintage machine workshop this morning actually um, was in a thrift store, I believe, uh, Salvation Army maybe, and saw a machine. And this is one of the things we offer in our vintage workshop is that in our private group, people often post a machine they've run across wondering if it's worth the price, should they purchase it as a good machine. So I kind of want to show you that example here. Um, this is inside the group, this is Nancy's post, and she's asking specifically about this um, Singer treadle. And her gut instincts, I think, were correct. She was asking if it's worth, I think it's priced at $100, um, and she was asking about it. The I, and it, This is one thing I have failed to mention in this whole series, that there are actual Singer reproduction machines out there. Let me flip through a few of these pictures for you. The first clue is how shiny and nice and kind of uh, I don't know what the word is. I don't want to say cheap, but they, the decals are just not as detailed or as nice as what you would see on a true um, Sphinx or Madison decal design. So that's usually your first clue. I'm not there to touch the machine, but oftentimes the, the lever that you see there uh, that, that adjusts the stitch length will be plastic and it just has a cheaper feel to it. Also, if you have a chance to lift up the machine, it's typically slightly lighter. Now what Singer did was reproduce these machines in the eighties. So it is not um, an authentic original machine. It's not a bad machine, but it's not a great machine. So um, I believe she said the asking price was a hundred dollars. And if she bought it today, it would be 30% off. And she was asking if that would be a fair price. Uh, the cabinet itself, I did ask her to check and make sure that that is true cast iron. If that's the case, um, I do think it would be worth $70 because the cabinet is in excellent condition. The machine isn't terrible. It just has a very cheap feel to it. And your cast iron looks to be in good condition. So in my opinion, depending on what your wants and needs are, and I know sometimes the need part is questionable, it would not be a terrible purchase. So I kind of wanted to share that. And then I'm also going to show you, um, I did want to mention this, our, let's see, is that sharing on that page? Uh, I have open enrollment on our featherweight workshop, which I know I haven't really talked much about in here. Um, let me share my screen again here. Oh, <laughs> let me open my Chrome tab here. All right, here we go. Is that good? No, nope, we're still not there. 
Okay. There we go. Okay. So on our website, if you go into sewingdocacademy.com and you go to workshops, then you're going to see our featherweight workshops here at the top. And the reason I mention this is because this is open for full enrollment for the next week as a founding member. Um, I, in case you didn't know, I also have a free how to use your featherweight workshop there to the left. There is no fee for that. It walks you through the entire use of your featherweight and your 301 if you need a brush up or have issues, it'll help address some of that. But there on the right, you're gonna see the featherweight workshop. If you go in and have not seen our page on this before, you can scroll through and you can look at things, but I wanna share, this is the absolute lowest our price, uh, that our enrollment fee is going to be for this workshop. To be clear, this is a one-time only Fee. This is not a reoccurring fee. It's not a monthly fee. It's one time. Um, and the other thing is, is when you come in as a founding member, what that means is we just launched this workshop recently, which was last September. And I like to have a nice representation of people in there to help us build the workshop, make it better. So I rely on the feedback and your experience to help make it better. With a founding member, our two the two top price tiers there, which is hybrid uh, VIP and hybrid diamond. Those both come with lifetime access to the live workshops that we do online. Those are called virtual led instru virtual instructor led uh, training. So it's just like we're doing here, but in Zoom where we can talk to each other. Um, but both of those come with the lifetime option where you're gonna get lifetime Q&A sessions and workshops uh, for life. With all of the tiers, you're going to get access to our on-demand learning library for the rest of your life. So there is no, again, there, on these cases, there is no monthly reoccurring fee. You pay one time and you're in. This enrollment level is only open for another week. So next Wednesday when we meet here, the doors will be closed on that. I will do a, web, a webinar and another enrollment I think at the end of February, but the price structure completely changes. So if anybody has been contemplating that, then uh, now is the time. Also on the front page, which I don't know that I can do from here. Um, I, I have a lot of people. This is We're the only people that have ever attempted to do this, which is virtual learning. It's been a phenomenal experience. And, and it was scary in the beginning because I didn't know how I could teach this stuff remotely. I feel like we've conquered hurdles. We have two workshops open at this point. And right down here on the right side of the screen, you'll see there is a little chat box. Is that showing up on your? Yeah, it is. There's a little chat box. If you want to um, set up a time, I'm happy to talk to you on Zoom if you have specific questions to know if the workshop is a good fit for you. Well, for this one or the vintage machine workshop, then I'm happy to do that. We can also chat there. And if we can, we can email whatever makes you comfortable. So um, please reach out if you're considering this, but not really sure if it's the right workshop for you. All right. So let me get back over into here. Let me stop sharing my screen. And I am going to be smart this week. <laughs> and to avoid um, the mishap we had last week, I am going to kind of address our uh, housekeeping up front here. Let me share my screen. And all right. So I want to tell you a little bit about what's coming up because we are next week is our webinar. You've, we've mentioned that many times. So next Wednesday at the same time, it will be about an hour and 20 minutes. If I had to guess, if you've seen our webinar before, but had not enrolled in the Vintage Machine Workshop. It is a lot different this time. One of the things that I've come to realize, our workshop's been open for two months now, which are two and a half months, and it's been fantastic. I think we have 57 people enrolled right now. It's become a really tight community. We're all starting to get to know each other personally. Um, but I I originally started this with the intentions of teaching you to take care of your own machine so that you're, you're not just taking them into a service shop. You're empowered to do it yourself. It makes better purchases. And this is where I learned how to go take that $15 uh, Kenmore at the uh, yard sale and turn it into a working machine and either keep it for myself or sell it for $150 uh, with a couple hours worth of work. Um, what I did not anticipate was how many people have realized how much fun it is. And of course, you can only collect so many machines for yourself. What do you do with <laughs> all the machines you collect? If you can use this skill for retirement income, side income, or full service business, um, I'm going to, it's all structured so that you 
don't have to wait till you get to a certain point to start making money. So we're going to add in a few more components that if that's your desire, then we're going to help lead you to that spot. So I get a lot of emails from people saying, I'm tired of corporate America. I want to retire, but I need some side income. This is the way to do it. This is how I built my entire business. Um, when you get the basics under your belt, it's really easy to find these machines and either flip them to resell, and then you can start being a resource for your community. So we're going to add a lot of that in, and I will cover that next week. Um, you'll see the inside of the on-demand library in the live classroom, so you'll get a feel of what it feels like. Um, there will be a free lesson on cleaning the exterior of your machine. I have a fantastic example that just came up last night. I took screenshots from a very well-known Facebook group. A lady asked a question and got I don't know what, eight or nine different answers, and they were all wrong. Uh, so I have a few examples of um, cleaning your machine. Uh, enrollment is going to be open. We do have two crazy bonuses. I forgot to mention on the Featherweight Workshop, if you do enroll in this next week as a founding member, you will get access to the motor service and rewiring and light socket rewiring workshop that will be launched in February. So um, I'll cover that later too. But just so you know, if you enroll in the Featherweight Workshop this week, you're going to get that for free. And that's a $169 value. Okay, so on our upcoming live series after next week, in, on Wednesday, February 2nd, I am going to do a little bit of an overview on our workshops as a whole. What you've seen this whole week has been focused, or this last month, has been pretty much focused on vintage machines. But I am inundated with emails of people asking, what about my, my Bernita? What about my Janome? What about my machine that I'm working on now? What can we do with that? So I want to give you um, a layout. Again, no one has ever attempted to do what we're doing. Um, most of the industry has shunned me because I am giving all of the things that have been happening in service shops for years. There's a lot of secrets and things, a lot of knowledge that would change the way that the world works. So um, I want to give you a layout of exactly what 2022 and 2023 look like for us. On uh, February 9th and 16th, we are going to focus on the featherweight and the 301. Um, lots of tips and tricks in there. We're going to talk about value if you want to buy or sell. We'll talk about purchasing and some shipping tips, which is a big one. Uh, we're going to talk about repainting. Lots of questions about repainting featherweights uh, and lots of tips and tricks. And history and fun and facts. That's one of my favorite parts. And then on Wednesday, 23rd, will be our featherweight. Webinar. So again, um, after next week, the featherweight workshop will close completely and then we'll open for re-enrollment again for a week at the end of February. So let's get into this week's. Um, there's a lot to cover today. We're talking about evaluating machines for purchase. Um, leading up to this, we've talked about looking for machines, where to find them, what kind of machine. Now we're going to talk about going in with a plan, which kind of is my whole theme this week and next week. First, you want to either make sure you have someone you can rely on um, for service and restoration. And I don't know about your area. We do have one known technician that's associated with a dealer um, in our area, and he will still work on vintage machines. That's where his um, his family's been doing it for, I think, three generations now. I have noticed in the last few years, though, that it's getting to be less and less the type or the the brand that they will accept. Um, there's like another shop that used to be known for restoration. All those, they're, it's just not, it's not that people think that they just want to sell you a new machine also. I also want to say that a lot of this comes from the business model. So we are known for restoration in my shop. We're known for finding parts no one else will, but it's extremely time consuming and costly. So if you're a modern a uh, service shop attached to a dealer, it may not fit their business model to have a trained technician, which is impossible to find, to work on vintage machines and be able to meet the overhead. So it's not just that dealers want to sell you a new machine. It's just that most of the time it's not worth it in their eyes to fix these machines. Um, so if you are looking for someone, you have to make sure that they are skilled in vintage machines specifically. There is out there on YouTube and probably Facebook, I did a video earlier this year talking about why there's a shortage of sewing machine technicians, what it takes to become one, and why modern dealers don't do it. If you go to training, I've been to training through Janome, Viking, and Brother, and all three of them taught me 
modern service, which means dealing with computers and things like that more than anything else. We did not learn manual timing. We didn't, And those are the things you have to do in vintage machines. So make sure the person you choose to work with is specifically skilled in vintage machines. Your other option, of course, is to learn to clean and lubricate, make minor repairs, find parts and restore them yourself. So in my opinion, and in the conversations I've had with our vintage machine workshop participants, that also helps you to make better decisions about the machines that you purchase. In the beginning, I feel like it's like an avalanche. You've discovered this new world, your can of worms is open and you want all the machines. But then at some point you start to notice the things that are like red flags, which is what we're gonna go through today. Okay, so um, I'm gonna start, all of this is in your handout this week. There's a lot of checklists in there. Um, so don't feel like you have to take notes. This video is going to live on so you can come back and refer to it. But we're going to talk, if you have a chance to ask the seller, whether it's through eBay or Marketplace, or um, if you're like an antique store, probably not. But it's nice to know if you can get the history of the machine. Uh, I would say 90% of the time, you won't find out anything. If there's one owner, that to me, that's very valuable to know. If it was well cared for and maintained, occasionally I have bought machines where there's actually a service record in with the machine that gives you the last service dates and what was done to it. And I think those are great um, things to hold on to. How it was acquired. Um, I especially like to ask this question if it's um, someone who knows nothing about sewing machines. This is typically going to be the listing on Marketplace or where at eBay, even where the machine is photographed with the back instead of the front because they don't know any better. Um, and I'm always curious if you don't sew, why did you have this machine? Typically, it's a deceased family member or they found it in a house when they moved in. It's just nice to know. Um, why are they selling it? And this is especially key if it seems to be in excellent condition at a really low price. Um, for one, I feel like this rules out scams, which I have not done enough research on to present on yet. There are tons of scams out there. Um, the biggest two right now that I see is with featherweights. I think that there was a common listing. I don't even know where it was listed. I'm going to say Craigslist, probably maybe Facebook, um, selling featherweights for $89. You see one price for $89, chances are if it was legit, it's gone. Um, if not, it's probably not legit. The other one is that there is a sewing machine store closing somewhere and the lady is selling off her entire inventory for $79 for all machines. If it's too good to be true, it's too good to be true. So um, I do see a lot of them with featherweights, though. Just I think asking questions and being persistent rules out the scams because they don't have time or the want to deal with you. So when we get into, okay, so when uh, when it was last serviced by whom, again, you're probably not going to get any answers unless somebody just ha is like thinning the herd. Um, does it work is a key um, question. And for me, that's because you can kind of feel out, do they know, really know about the machine? If you're looking at a machine that appears to be in good condition and you ask if it works and get an answer, it's just to me, it helps gauge the overall experience. And, okay. And does it have any accessories with it, if that's important to you? Now, when you're looking at a machine for purchase, um, if you're looking at it, what premium? Now, I think back to when I said the one machine that's my collection is a grasshopper, um, an Elna grasshopper. Chances are the way I'm going to look for that is going to be different than an investment machine to um, repair and resell or whatever. Um, for a premium machine, I'm going to want to try and obviously um, look for the best one and be prepared to pay a fair price for it. Um, when you're going to look at a machine, I, I feel like you should put together a little pack of things to take with you. And you want to control the variables when you go to look for a machine. That means that you cannot rely on the seller to know anything about the machine, especially how to use it or if it actually works. So even though they tell you it works, you don't really know because they don't know either. All right. So um, many of them will tell you it's an excellent condition just based on how it looks, but that doesn't mean um, that it is. So I always suggest research as much as you can about the machine before you even go look at it in person. This is not easy to do if you're like a, an antique um, hunter like I am. I like to go to antique malls. You're not going to be prepared. We do have cell phones, so I do bookmark things on my phone that I'm looking for or things to refer to. Um, but um, if you, the more that you can research before you go look for a specific machine, the better prepared you can be. And uh, as much as I say there is really bad information on the the webs on uh, 
the internet about vintage machines, I will say there is a wealth and a growing wealth of information on the other side, which is how to use the machine. I have not seen a whole lot of really bad info. Sometimes it's missing things like common knowledge points, but you can search all day long for how to use machines and you can come up with some gold. So if it's, especially if it's something not common, like a, not a singer, if it's um, one of the Japanese made ones, just see if you can, what you can find on it. So at the very least, if you're going to go look at a machine that, that someone is selling, you want to know how to thread the machine, how to insert the needle properly and load the bobbin case. Those are things that you really want to be familiar. And with vintage machines are all a little different. So um, if you can find a manual, which are I finding a lot of them online for free these days in instructions, print them out and take them with you because you don't know what you're going to encounter. Um, to print out the notes and all the things for setting up your a sewing machine, which I have a lot of notes that you're going to get today to take with you. Um, make a little bag with these items. Uh, we were just at Hobby Lobby the other day and they have these nice little clear bags or if you like to sew, make one for yourself. It's a nice little clear bag that would fit all of these items perfectly and I think it would be great to take with you. So you want to take any notes or printouts that you made about the machine. Take regular quilting cotton. This right here is what I used to test sew on for customers when, um, when we um, when we test sew, the reason you want to take quilting cotton is because it's just standard cotton. You don't want to take anything that's going to change your variables. That would be stretch material. Don't take a t-shirt. Don't take, um, you know, spandex, just a piece of quilting cotton that doesn't have stretch to it. Um, that way you can, you know, that if it's going to stitch, it's going to be okay. Um, you want to take your own needle because if you're going to get to sew on a machine, I would not trust how long that needle's been on there or if it had been changed when the person was using it. Um, if you're going to take regular quilting cotton, this is why you want to remove the variables. You can take a universal needle that's a size 12 and know that it's going to be okay. With thread, my number one recommendation if you're test sewing on a new machine is Guterman. This way you're not carrying a whole bunch of different threads with you. It's going to work in your size 12 needle and will work great on cotton fabric. The reason I say Guterman is because it is a high quality, um, it is a long staple cotton, but it's also sturdy enough. I do, I know Orifil is my personal favorite. It's what I test sew with in almost every machine. With vintage machines, some of them don't like the, the thinness of Orifil. So I find Guterman really works across almost all machines. It's also really accessible at Joann's. So it's not an expensive thread. You can buy a couple spools of it stick it in your bag and then know that it's going to be okay no matter what machine you get to sew on. And then I like a small flashlight. A couple years ago, Paul had purchased me one. It was about this big. It has a little button on the top. I have been in so many places, especially in, when I used to go to people's homes to buy machines and they would be shoved down in the dark corner in the basement where you couldn't see anything. They're kind of hoping you're just going to hand them money and hightail it out of there without really looking at the machine. And that small flashlight came in very handy for dark places or uh, low light places. And then bobbins. Um, bobbin, we are going to do an entire presentation on bobbins at some point. Um, bobbins are hard because there are so many different types and the type of bobbin matters. So put this in your research list when you're looking and considering a machine. The majority of vintage machines do take class 15 or 66. Uh, I think almost all front loading Kenmore's are 15s. Most singers are 15 or 66, but put a, a variety and label them and put them in your bag so that you always have your own bobbin. Because I can tell you half the time when you buy one of these vintage machines, the bobbin that's in it is not, they're not even correct. So as far as what to look for, this is one of the checklists in your handout today. Obviously, first and foremost, you want to look at electrical. So you don't want any broken or bare wires. This is extremely common on vintage machines. Um, old wiring does wear out. It mostly depends on where the machine was stored the bulk of its life. If it's been in a moist or hot environment, you're probably going to see a lot of cracking and things. But you also want to look for rust or moisture damage. Now, neither of these things to me mean that it's a, a bad purchase. Both of those can be repaired. I have run across a handful of machines that I would pass on because it's like they were sitting in a lake for a couple years, but even heavy rust on most of these cast iron machines can be resolved. Um, that doesn't mean I would pay top dollar for them. I would probably ask for it for free or a couple dollars, but that machine on the left, I would definitely not make a big investment, but I also wouldn't run from it because I feel like it's a good learning experience. 
Um, you want to make sure the hand wheel is intact. I put one of the Singer hand wheels on here. Um, obviously, if you have a spoked wheel or a metal one, it's probably going to be okay. It's more of your plastic um, hand wheels that they started making in the 60s that are my concern. Um, if that little, um, when you push on that bobbin one, it sort of flexes out. Just make sure everything on the hand wheel works like it's supposed to. Knobs and levers are probably our biggest um, challenge when it comes to vintage machines. So what you see here, there is a knob for stitch selection. There is a knob that helps with the stitch width. You've got a knob for darning down there. I can tell you that if you're buying a machine that's, even if it's a Singer, it really doesn't matter what brand. If those knobs are broken, and by broken, I mean like plastic and cracked and broken off, the chances of being able to replace any of those levers are very slim. They made so many models, especially in the Japanese family, that there's nobody producing anything like that across any machines. I can't even think of anywhere that we can buy a lever for. That metal lever up there that does the needle um, centering left, middle, and center, or left, middle, right, um, we did just repair one on a, what's that, a Signature Deluxe, which is a Japanese one. Thankfully, the lever snapped where the soldering or the... Uh, yeah, the welding was, thank you. The weld is, and we were able, and Paul was able to fix it. That was probably the only time we've ever fixed a lever of that nature. So if you're missing knobs or levers, that's when you're going to have to decide, is it worth the purchase? If you're okay with not having that function or finagling away for it to work, it'd be good. But the chances of you finding any of those knobs you see pictured there on eBay or on the aftermarket, it's very slim. So that's a really important note on those. Um, for the bobbin case, again, most vintage machines are you're going to see our front or side loading have an external bobbin case or the metal ones like this in the 400 and 500 series. Uh, those are fairly easy to replace. It's more of the specialty machines that use some kind of odd bobbin. I can't think of one off the top of my head. Foth has a lot of odd bobbins, but I know you can get those. You just really want to make sure that what is supposed to be there is there. And then you have shuttle bobbins, which go in like the Singer 128s. Um, anything Singer is still easier to get when you get into a lot of the old, old treadles that have um, different size shuttles. It can be a challenge. I had one customer bring in this stunning um, treadle. It was a Singer and it had pearl inlay all the way through it. And it was, it was really small, like maybe nine inches wide um, that we looked for three years for a shuttle for that machine and still never found one. So at least it looks pretty in her hallway, but it's not usable because there's no shuttle. I would still not have passed on that deal. I think she paid $200 for six treadles in North Carolina, and that was one of them. All right. So um, also look for accessories. Is If you're buying on eBay and someone ships something to you and they promised a manual or feeder attachments or cams, you would do those items if they were in your listing. With Facebook, there's really no course of action, but when you go to pick up, you want to look for anything that was promised to you. And like we talked about um, last week, if cams are important to you to be able to do those specialty stitches, you definitely want to make sure that they are the correct cams or and that they're all there or what you need is there. So manuals, um, presser feed if they were promised, button holders like we talked about, and cams. And when you can test so, uh, I can't think of too many. Now, so the last time I really did a lot of machine picking like this was probably about eight or nine years ago. Um, I still see some I like now, but we were really on a mission. We were answering ads. Um, I can't think of too many times that they really let me uh, sew on a machine, but that's because I wasn't buying premium machines. I did test sew on an Elna electronic uh, one time, but some people will still let you, especially if it's premium priced. What you want to do is there's a checklist in this checklist is in your handout. I also did a handy. Um, I'm very proud of this piece, by the way. I did a handy layout that's going to be in there. This one's on a Kenmore. I have one on a straight stitch only. Um, it will help if you don't know all the names of the parts. It's also a nice reminder to go through and make sure that all these things are here, because if they're missing, you may not know. So you want to turn the hand wheel and make sure it moves freely. That's number one. You don't want to sew on a machine if it's not turning freely because it may not be a gone machine. Like it, it still may be worth it, but if it has been sitting neglected for years and it hasn't um, been lubricated properly, if you plug that thing in and hit the metal to try to get it to move, you may really do some damage. 
So make sure the hand wheel moves um, freely. Then you wanna check and make sure that the electrical is okay before plugging in. Uh, I do have a machine over here I'm gonna demo on when we're done with this part. If you are gonna get to test sew on it, I do suggest you bring your thread, wind your own bobbin with your thread, and then put a needle on the machine, the one that you brought with you. Um, you're gonna thread the upper thread. And the threading is, is important because you're gonna test sew, but more than anything, I want you to go through the thread path. Um, and you're, what you're looking for are the same things that I pointed out um, in this little handout. When you go through the thread path, you're looking for broken, uh, thread guides or anything that's missing that should be there. There are thread guides on all machines. How many is the variable? Um, you're going to install the bobbin, check the bobbin case while you can, see if it's rested. All those things can be repaired, but you just want to make sure that you're paying the price that you should be paying, paying for this machine. You're going to bring up the bobbin thread. If you don't do this already, I highly suggest this on all machines. When I test sew, so, um, before and after service, I do this for every single machine, even the ones that have thread cutters or um, that have it wrap around. You hold the tail of your upper thread, turn the hand wheel toward you, and then it'll bring up the bobbin thread. Um, this helps keeping your from being all gunked up in the beginning. And then you're going to test sew both straight and zigzag if you have the option. If you're test sewing on a straight stitch machine, that's all you have. But I do feel like with zigzag, you can find things that maybe um, you wouldn't find with a straight stitch, um, especially the timing being off. That being said, though, um, the timing being off on vintage machines is very, very rare. So um, if it's not picking up stitches, it's usually user error. It's usually not timing on those. Or if you're trying to zigzag and you and the, the needle's not really moving, chances are it's gunked up in there. That doesn't mean that there's anything broken. Unless you're moving into the 60s and 70s machines, there's not a lot of components to be broken, but things get gunked up pretty easy on the inside. So these are some of my really important um, things to remember when you're going through this process. One, it's really easy to miss a step in the threading, especially if you're under pressure. If you're sitting in a stranger's home and you're looking at this machine, it's already kind of awkward. So you may be feeling like you're under a microscope while somebody's standing there watching you do this. So first of all, breathe. But second of all, you're really just going through this to, to check the machine. Whether or not it sews is kind of a variable, but you just know that you can miss a step very easily. If you aren't 100% certain on how to use the particular machines, you may not get the best results. So if it's one that you're new to and the threading looks different, it's, it's just gonna be a learning curve. And again, I keep repeating this, vintage machines rarely have timing issues or this, so that means the stitch is not forming properly is probably a user error or something gunked up in the machine. It's not typically timing. These are not hard and fast rules, but this has been my experience on parts that are usually easy to find on machines. Okay, so we have motor belts, and that's pretty true. I think on my first week or last week, I did mention a few brands. I think it was the first week, Ricar, um, Montgomery Ward, White, uh, J.C. Penney, those are the ones that are the, the really hard ones to find of any type. Um, there are some universal belts, but when you get into the ones that have the belt inside the machine, it gets a little harder to do that. Um, bobbin winder tires are pretty easy to find. They're fairly universal. Um, there is a gentleman, I'll have to see if I can find his link and I'll post it. Um, one of the big complaints about the the white featherweights and other machines like the four, the four and 500 series used to have off white um, bobbin winder tires and they look so much nicer. Um, this gentleman actually makes or has them produced. The bobbin winder tires you can get in white, but you can get them in like eight different colors. So you've got pink and purple and green and aqua and they have matching felt pads that go on this bullpen. He has been amazing because he can now provide the white ones that everybody wants for their machine. So bobbin winder tires are fairly easy to find. Bobbin cases and bobbins, we talked about that. Any of those two style of bobbin cases are pretty easy to find. Um, needle plates are fairly easy to find. When you get into some of the Japanese ones, you'll find a needle plate that has a hinge on it with a, um, that like flips up to get to the bobbin case. Sometimes those are harder to find, but standard needle plates are easy. Lee cords, which are the power cord that comes out of your foot pedal. Um, they can be easily repaired or replaced. And then spool pins. Um, I'm going to talk about spool pins when I show you this machine in a minute. 
anything with Singer, anything that's on the top of the machine um, can be replaced. There's plastic and metal options. Um, you might have to do a little creative repair, but that can be fixed. Now, parts that are harder to find, we talked about knobs and levers. I would not count on, unless you find a source through eBay, some specialist that's selling off parts machines that has gotten back to you. If you find a machine with one of those broken knobs, if you have to either be okay with having the machine with a broken knob or pass on it. Um, for a machine that I think is really pretty that I want that's low priced, I would maybe take one and hope that at some point I'd find it, but I would not count on levers and knobs. Um, thread guides. This one is very important. This is actually a picture off the machine I'm going to show you here in a little bit. If you look at the top of that picture on the machine, there's two little what they call pigtail thread guides. The cool part is they're actually usually screwed in where they can come off and be replaced. The hard part is nobody makes those. So they have to come off of a parts machine or um, some odd source that's not easy to find. We've had a handful of Japanese brother machines and a couple neckies where the, the only thing they need are those thread guides and I can't get them. So keep that in mind when you're looking at those machines that have those pigtail thread guides on them. Needle clamps. This should be easy, but they're not. Um, I think Singer is fairly available on the aftermarket and maybe some of the others, but when you get into Japanese ones, there's so many different styles. Um, you'd have to find someone with a large quantity of spare parts or things that have come off machines to try and find needle clamps. I actually don't find many missing needle clamps on machines though, which is good. Um, and shuttles. We've talked about this a couple times. Um, on most Singer machines, your 128s, 127s, 28s, 27s, those you're usually, and um, some, I don't even know which other ones, Singers are usually okay. It's when you get into the really old machines where nobody's producing their parts that are kind of questionable. All right, so let's talk about um, when it comes time to make an offer. First of all, I say make an offer because rarely do I purchase a machine without making an offer. Um, I want to stress this though, making an offer does not mean lowball the seller. I do not advocate for trying to, um, I guess, you know, being the scammer on the other side. I don't think it's okay to have, and I, I kind of weigh this, you know, this happened a lot in the featherweight community for a long time where people are like, you know, this lady's mother passed and she's going to give it to me for $50. Is that fair? You have to decide where you can sleep with that at night. It would be hard for me to take um, just $50 when I know that it's worth probably 500. Um, so I would probably try to fix that a little bit for myself. Um, but most people do set their asking price higher than they're hoping to get for it because they do know people want to haggle. So, um, you are going to find people that are delusional about that, but, um, but most people expect some haggling to happen. So what triggers me to make an offer is number one, broken or missing parts. And obviously the harder it is for me to find the parts, then the lower my offer will be. So like the machine with the knobs and levers, if they were broken, I would probably offer them 10, 10 bucks. And I would take my evidence of like, you cannot find these knobs and levers and they're broken. Um, and if they're tied to it, they may say no. And you can watch that listing and you can still come back months later. If it's still there and you want it, you can ask for it, you know, still make the offer of like, it's still here. Um, bad electrical wiring, especially on a potted motor. I'm going to show you a picture of that here in a bit. Um, electrical wiring, I have not yet met a machine that we can't fix the wiring on, um, but it's going to cost you either in the learning curve or having someone do it. And I do have an example of that here in a minute. Surface damage. Now, you have to expect a certain amount of wear on the machine, especially if it's priced appropriately. But if somebody's asking $700 for a Singer 66 that has scratches and gouges and missing decals all over it, that's that's not even the, in the realm of of, uh, <laughs> of just good thinking. So um, I do use that, though, for premium price machines that do have damage you maybe didn't see in the picture. And then, of course, accessories, but I only gauge that to a degree. To be honest with you, the majority of people that buy machines in our shop are not looking for extras. They just want the machine. They either have their own accessories or they're happy to go find what they have. So I think you have to be reasonably uh, expect, ex just expect that accessories are not always going to be with the machine. What typically happens is um, the machine will be passed down when someone one dies and then it gets put in the closet and then you have someone who doesn't sew. they're like what is this box of weird parts and then it goes to goodwill and then they find the machine like 10 years later that's usually what happens so i feel like accessories 
are only a bargaining point for me if it's a machine that highly relies on the accessories. So as far as making an offer, I do have little tricks that I used to use. I used to track machine listings. So if somebody listed a machine I was interested in, but it's priced too high, I will watch for how long it's been listed. Um, and I used to keep a notebook because I figured out, and this is back in the Craigslist, Craigslist days, that not only would they um, have the listing, some people just renew them so that after three months, they'll just relist the, the machine and either drop the price or keep it the same, but they would also cancel the listing and relist it. And I kind of got to know the machine. So I kind of kept a log and how long the machine's been sitting there available to me has a few clues. So if it's been listed three or four weeks, chances are the seller is probably willing to accept an offer. You just don't know how low they'll go. Um, I like, as I said earlier, I almost always make an offer because it, it's, um, it's just kind of expected. So even if it's a brand new listing um, and it has visible issues and I feel like I have some bargaining power, it never hurts to make a slightly lower offer. Uh, if you don't really care about bargaining and you like the price, then buy it. It's worth repeating. Please don't low, low ball the seller on a truly um, unfair offer. So if somebody's selling a, you know, a really nice, super nice Kenmore for $75 and has the accessories, don't bargain them down to 25. <laughs> Um, and I would only offer a terribly low price if the machine is obviously in terrible condition and the price is unrealistic. But keep in mind, people that do this, you will see these posts on Facebook a lot where somebody's got a rusted through and through Singer machine. It's a 66. It's not uncommon. And they're asking $400 for it. Um, be prepared to, for them to decline it and maybe even ignore you. I, I feel like there's a lot of ignoring that happens with that. So here's my uh, collection of other things that I just want you to keep in mind. Even if the machine isn't moving smoothly um, or it's partially seized and it has rust in it, it does not mean it's a lost cause. You just, again, have to decide, are you going to invest in someone taking care of it and make it work again? Or you're going to have to do the work yourself or some combination. Um, if you try to test so and it seems to be working OK, but you're having trouble getting it to stitch right, Again, the chances are it's probably you or some minor glitch in the machine. Very rarely have we encountered um, a good solid vintage machine having some kind of internal broken problem. And knobs and levers can be intact and like working, like they're there and either frozen or um, like if you take the stitch width, which controls your zigzag and you you change the, the knob on it, you put it on the white zigzag, but the needle is not moving, that's just all signs of things being gummed up. So you just want to make sure the levers and knobs are intact. But if they're not doing the function they're supposed to, that means there's probably built up lubricant in there that has to come out and get relubricated. To me, that is not a hard no, especially if it's one I really like and it's really pretty. Um, electrical wiring, again, can be um, repaired or replaced on, um, I think we've never, have we ever had one we haven't been able to do, Paul? Um, I don't think we have. No, I don't think so. Okay, so electric, so we, I wouldn't call that a lost cause, but it is great bargaining power when you're buying machines. Um, and, and most people know that I think if you've got bare wires or cut wires where it was in a cabinet, that's good bargaining power. And then if someone is claiming the machine was recently serviced, don't assume that you have the same definition of service. Um, I see this a lot in the vintage machine groups where one person means like you probably assume that they took it to someone, it was fully serviced and cleaned out and done everything like it was supposed to. And then for the person at home, half the time that means that they kind of dusted some dirt off and squirted oil in there, which is not serviced. So don't assume what's, when they say service, that that's mean it, what it really was. <clears throat> so if a machine was truly serviced or you're buying it from a shop like ours, then you're gonna have to expect to pay more because we did the work on it. That means that like the machine I'm gonna show you here, it's gonna be a consignment machine in our shop. If we service it, we give you a 90 day warranty with it. You are going to pay more because you're getting a basically a certified working machine. There's no guesswork. You're getting premium is what we call it. Uh, many machines are underpriced. And they're just sitting there because people don't know what to do to make them work. Again, that's typically by people who don't sew. If they don't know how to sew, they probably don't know how to do minor repairs. Um, so there are bargains everywhere. This kind of loops me back to our vintage machine workshop. And we are focusing a lot on this part because there are so many unused machines out there that can be working in good homes, especially when we're still in a time of sewing machine shortage. 
So with the red guidance and skills, it's really easy to build that side business, um, buying these cheap machines, you can flip machines. Um, I built my entire business by buying machines somewhere in the 15 to $70 range, getting them all working again, doing the rewiring, doing the motor service. And then all of them have sold for at least $150, many of them for 300. So that's very, very common if you can, if you get your skills. Now I want to come back to the potted motor that we were talking about earlier. If you're not sure what a potted motor is, this is a Singer 201, one of, in my opinion, one of the most fantastic sewing machines on earth. That little black box there on the back is the potted motor. And what that means is this is a gear driven machine. Instead of a motor belt, there is a gear house in there that turns the hand wheel, that turns the shaft and turns the whole machine. Um, what's common, and I don't have a picture, I couldn't find one, there at the bottom of the box, there's wiring that comes out of there and goes into the receptacle. It is extremely common for that wire to be deteriorated. Now you can't, sometimes we can manage to put a little bit of shrink wrap and save it, but the majority of the time, this whole component has to come off the machine. We have to get in there, take it all apart, and there's a lot of soldering that has to happen. And there is what we call the point of no return. If you clip one of the wires too short, there is no saving that motor. So when you're, if you if you decide to take your machine to the shop to have this done, um, you're looking at, in our shop, this is just my pricing, it's different for everybody. But I don't think anybody in our area even will do this service anymore. The machine service itself is $82. The motor service and rewiring is 180 because of the delicate nature of it. That is a total of $262 after you've purchased the machine. I'm going to go ahead and tell you now because we're talking about the Vintage Machine Workshop next week. The lowest, uh, there's two options on our Vintage Machine Workshop. One of them is, the lowest one is $249. And so that's just the, the, the lowest level that's cheaper than it costs to have this rewired. With our Vintage Machine Workshop, you're gonna get the rewiring and the, the motor service workshop. So you would be paying $249 to do everything we did to this machine for $262. So I also have another example. If you've seen my blog post about this machine, I'm very proud of my work on this machine. Um, this is a, a Singer 500 Series Rocketeer. I wish the picture on the left really did justice to what this machine looked like when it came in. I had to wipe it down a bit just to carry it because it was so covered in soot and dirt. It's a machine that survived a fire. Um, I don't know the details of the fire. It didn't seem to have any direct uh, damage from a fire, but the inside, all of the oil and everything baked to the inside of the machine. So here is a before and after of this machine. I restored this for this gentleman. I did discount it just because I was allowed to film it for our workshop and use it as an example, and I had it forever. So restoration for this machine was $360. I use this machine to teach our workshop as our on-demand library. And again, our lowest price point is $249 right now. So when we open enrollment next week. So I just wanna illustrate this is why I kind of push you to empower yourself because I guarantee you, if you could have taken that to another shop, that's a $500 or $600 job um, that someone did. I just, I, I think our shop, we just like to be good to our customers. All right. So when we're talking about how much to pay, this is my shortest section because it really depends on you, unfortunately. There are no guidelines out there. There is no rules. There is no book. It's not like any other antique in the field where you can go find a reference book. There's nothing. Um, so there's nothing that will tell you what's fair or not fair. You're going to have to gut check yourself. Um, and a lot of what I've been trying to teach over the last three weeks, it, it's kind of moving in this direction so that you can get familiar and decide if it's a worth the investment for you. Um, basically, a person lists a machine at a selling price and either you're good with it or you pass or you make an offer. Um, and I've said this a million times, there are delusional people out there that will have a machine in terrible condition, but still call it old or rare and expect that they're going to get several hundred dollars for it. I do want to go back to Facebook for a minute because this is kind of the only way you can get um, any kind of idea on what you might find as a fair price. And the same thing if you're selling. This is a really good guideline if you're going to get into um, flipping machines, buying them and, and selling them. So this is on, on eBay. You can see I put in Singer 66 sewing machine up there. You're not going to look at the listings. I don't care anything about what a machine is listed for. So that's what you're seeing on this page. 
what you want to look for is over here on the left. You're going to scroll way down. And this one I still have on local pickup, I think. Um, but I'm not really, no, this is not, it doesn't matter. But you want to come down here and click sold items. Um, that, it was automatically going to also select completed items. So it's going to show you um, what items in the same area have been sold. So the first thing that pops up here, it says antique Singer 66 treadle head sewing machine and extra bobbins and attachments. This is going to tell me that they actually sold this machine for $158.96 with $43.95 in shipping. Uh, they offer free returns. And those, so those are the things I like to look at. I'm going to um, show you a couple more. Down here, there's also one that says it works. Vintage 1956 uh, Singer Model 66 Machine Extras. That one sold for $225. Then you're going to get down here. Oh, I was going to show you this too. This is blown up a little bit so you can see it. When you get down here to these two bottom ones, um, so this one sold for $225. That's what that means. Now, if you see this down here, it said $99.99 and it's scratched out. Um, that means that they accepted an offer, but you're not going to be able to see what offer they made and was accepted. Um, chances are somebody probably thought it was a parts machine or not worth it. And so somebody got a really good deal on that machine. Um, here's a few other examples. I'm going to So now I'm switching over to Bernina 930s, which we talked about are highly, highly, highly valued machines. Um, the difference here. You're looking at a Bernina 930 record. It says sewing machine and foot control. What you see is what you get. Nothing fancy, no cases. That machine sold for $500 with $51 in shipping. The one below that is important to note. It says nice Bernina uh, record 930 sewing machine, nine feet, just professionally serviced. My guess is that if they were asking $1,100 for it, the majority of, of that is because it has the case, it has the bed, it has the power cord foot pedal, it has all those feet. If you are a Bernina person, you know that feet are not cheap. Um, I think that's the biggest turnoff to the brand sometimes is that those feet are expensive. Um, if, if they're claiming it was just professionally serviced, um, then my guess is they maybe were able to produce documents that showed that it was just serviced. It sold for $1,100. Now this one down here, I really, really, really wanna show you. This is where my brain goes in my restoration efforts, okay? This machine down here, uh, it has no case, no cords. I clicked on the link and it said, couldn't test so because there's no cords with it. This is someone who knows nothing about sewing machines. Would I gamble and buy this sewing machine for $50? You bet I would. Um, so let's assume, and these are some assumptions I made, $50 for the sewing machine, right? Um, I didn't see anything for shipping. I'm going to assume if it's packaged and sent correctly, you're looking at $65 worth of shipping at least. Um, to buy a power cord, worst case scenario at retail prices, $30. Uh, foot pedal at $80, that's retail. I can probably get it cheaper wholesale. You're looking at $225 to get this machine sent to you. You clean it out, you lubricate it, you do what you need to do from the workshop. And I know I could go back and sell that machine locally for probably $800, even if it was just the machine and power cord and foot pedal. So that's just kind of where my brain goes and all of this. And I wanted to show you what's possible. But all, all of this was to say eBay can be a good resource. It's literally the only guide we have. I, I have not found any other way to gauge. You can kind of watch in Facebook Marketplace, but it's only going to show you what's for sale. Nothing in there shows you what it was sold for. eBay is the only service that we get that with. So that's really important to keep in mind. Um, here's a few more examples. Um, you can see here this, this one on top sold for $9.95. This one down here um, tested and works well. That one sold for $6.29. And then this one was listed for $1,500 and they accepted an offer. So like I said, most people are ex expecting you to, to accept an offer. So let me get out of here. Before I wrap up today, I'm going to switch my screen back over to our sewing machine. And I just kind of want to give you an idea of what you would be looking for. So let me switch my camera. Okay. Uh, I hope it works. No. Oh, that's not gonna work. Apparently my GoPro is not gonna work. All right, give me a sec. I guess I'll have to switch. Yeah, I don't know what I can do. All right, well, I will put up, um, let me switch my camera back over.
Yeah, my GoPro didn't work. <laughs> All right, what I was going to do is I was going to show you our um, white machine that we have set up here. But again, I, I'm still learning our cameras. My crow's in two now. Okay, we're good. <laughs> All right, so I tried to switch over. We tried a couple different cameras this week. I have it conquered in our workshops, not on our live presentations. So I will put up a few pictures of our white machine here. Um, and then again, in your handout, you have these things that you're gonna go through. Um, this is part of your checklist where you want to make sure your thread guides, your check springs, your upper tension assembly, all these things are um, intact if you're looking to buy a premium machine. So, and if you, um, like every other week, if you, um, if you uh, want the handout, just post a comment below. I do have everything up on our website right now for our um, previous ones with all the handouts and everything. That's sewingdocacademy.com slash Facebook live. It's up on the, um, the the bar there if you go under free stuff there's a little drop down that says handout so it's all there and i'll see if there's any since i'm a little under time i'm happy to look and see if there's any questions that i can answer let's see um i see melanie likes guterman also <laughs> all right joe says you have a featherweight that needs service and possibly some repair if you want to mail your, Joe, if you want to mail your machine, we can make that happen. <laughs> um, I can also teach you to do it yourself, but I understand if you don't want to. Um, all right. You guys are awesome. Seriously, thank you for being here with me every week. Um, if you have any questions about any of this, like I said, I just installed the little chat thing on the front page of our website. Um, so if you want it to be uh, a quick answer, Last night, someone messaged me and I was in the middle of dinner, so I couldn't quite get there. But um, what happens is if you try to chat with me and I'm not available, I will definitely get your answer back to you through email. Um, but if you have any questions about the workshop that's, that we're getting ready to open enrollment for, for vintage or for the featherweight one, um, and you're not sure, just let me know because I will tell you, I've told a number of people, I'm, you know, I don't know that you're ready for this because your interest isn't here. So I'm very honest with you. I'm not just trying to get you into the uh, workshop just to take your money. So all right. Well, I will see you all next week. It'll be one o'clock on Wednesday and I'm going to do a handout for next week also. So thank you all. You have a good day.